afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Barometer webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager at Barometer Capital. We thank you so much for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, you know, I hope everyone out there is enjoying uh, that extra hour of sleep they, they got on, on Sunday. Uh, as always, uh, we're going to provide you with a breakdown of our themes and uh, how we're trading our portfolios. Uh, and we'd be happy to obviously discuss, just answer questions at the tail end of this call. David will provide us with a brief macro overview. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the chat. And with that, I turn the conversation over to our chief investment strategist and president here at Barometer Capital, David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Pam. Thanks so much for hosting again this week. Always a pleasure, Dave. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you in person at some time soon. Um, lots, of ta lots to talk about this week. Uh, so I'm going to jump right in. Uh, it's been a very busy week in capital markets. Um, just from a macro standpoint, 30,000 foot view, we continue to believe we are in a structural bull market. Uh, it feels like market's been rallying for a while and, and we've had uh, some good years, but certainly uh, things can go on longer. Structural bull market can go on 15, 20 years. Uh, last one started in 1981, didn't end until just around 2000. Previous one was 16 years in the making. Uh, this bull market in the U.S. broke out in 2013. So we are eight years in, uh, but there is certainly room to go with corrections, of course. Uh, we think we've been going through a bottoming process in rates and bottoming processes in rates take a long time. In fact, you know, it was five, six years, the last uh, rate cycle that bottomed in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And we started this one in 2017, 18. Uh, and uh, arguably, I think we saw the generational lows at the pandemic lows uh, in 2020. We've been going through a bottoming in the commodities market. In fact, we've seen a nice reversal. Uh, these are 10 year rolling returns. Uh, and we know that at the end of structural bear market and commodities, uh, you could have minus 6% per year over 10 years, minus eight, minus nine. Uh, we got to a minus 9.8% as of April, 2021. Certainly there's been a good bounce since then. Uh, and uh, we in fact have been coming back through the zero line, but again, very, very early stages here. So our big belief is understand the big structural backdrop, build portfolios that are relevant given that backdrop. We don't have to be in every sector all the time. Uh, our job is to find places with a tailwind where we're seeing net new investment flows come in, where they could come in for a long time and then try and find the subsectors within those asset classes that play well into the current economic environment. So S&P has been very strong coming off the lows in November of 2020. There was a, a, a corrective period, October, November 2020, after the rally off the bottom in March of 2020. Uh, and after channeling higher uh, over the course of about nine months, market corrected through end of August, September, and October. Now, of course, S&P 500 uh, is a funny index. 40% uh, of the index is made up of technology. Six or seven big companies make up a big slice of the index. So it doesn't always show you what's happening underneath the surface. We like to delve into that. But nonetheless, following the corrective period, uh, right on cue, as far as seasonality goes, market turned higher uh, in the middle of October. We were fortunate because some of our key leadership themes which are highly economically sensitive sectors, actually started to outperform the market in August, which gave us clues to the fact that it was likely to be a shallow fall correction. And we've certainly seen a reacceleration since then. And here we are, you know, the 9th of November and the market's been making new highs. In fact, as of yesterday, eight new all-time highs in a row. Now on that, interestingly, statistically, when the market has made eight closing highs in a row, one might think it's time for a correction, but statistically about 75% of the time, one month out and three months out, market was several percent higher. So uh, we don't try and anticipate, our job is to recognize change and we have a strong backdrop for, for the S&P 500. We also have a strong backdrop for the NASDAQ. NASDAQ has been certainly working its way higher nicely. Some great earnings reports out of some of the very large cap tech stocks. 
Uh, there were some sloppy ones too, so you had to dodge some bullets. Uh, but again, this continues to be leadership in the market. Now, just to put it in perspective, I talked about how we can get very long bull markets. The bull market of the 1980s and 90s lasted 7,700 7, days and returned about 1,500%. So, so far since we broke out in 2013, it's 30, 30, about 3,000 days, a little less than half the length of the bull market in the 1980s and 90s. And while it feels like the market's been great, uh, S&P is up about 500% versus 1,500 in the 80s and 90s. So no two bull markets are the same. Uh, the bull market from 1960, sorry, 19, um, uh, uh, 51 to 66 lasted 15 years. It was very significant from a percentage point terms. But I just want to keep it in perspective. You know, we have to look at all the asset classes, where we sit within structural bull markets or bear markets and build the portfolios accordingly. Of course, equities continue to be a pretty important part of our portfolios. On the other hand, uh, uh, fixed income has had a bull market for 40 years, looks sloppy, is behaving poorly. And as a result, we have very low exposure to fixed income in our portfolios. As far as our breadth models go, what's happening under the surface? We know that all of our short-term models for breadth in North America are improving. The percent of stocks above the 50-day moving average, percent of stocks above the 150-day moving average, or 30-week. That's a long-term smooth moving average. The number of stocks above that are rising nicely. Percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum uh, at about 70% of the stocks in the market. So that has been expanding since summer. Uh, and the percent of stocks making new highs versus new lows over 80%. So <clears throat> these, when they are positive, don't point to weakness. It would be rare for the market to have any kind of sell-off before we see days or weeks of deterioration in these indicators. Percent of stocks on the NYSE index that are in long-term uptrends is at about 68%. And that's a healthy number. It's expanding. It means throw a dart at a board. And if you were throwing them at a list of stocks, 70% of them are working their way higher. It's a very productive type of market to be invested in. From a seasonality perspective, we've been pointing out late October through April tends to be a very strong period. We've entered that period and the index on Q made a nice turn uh, in the middle of October and then has followed through since then. We've talked a little bit about mid cap and small cap stocks. The fact that they consolidated from February of last year, we pointed out two weeks ago, it looked like they were ready to break out. And of course, this is what happened over the last week. Small caps really took off. Uh, uh, higher. Uh, the percent of stocks trading at a three-month high is now over 30%. That tends to be associated with the beginning of good rallies in this area. Uh, and relative to the S&P 500 for the first time, uh, really since early 2021, small and mid-cap stocks are leading those very large cap stocks, which we believe are quite well-owned, perhaps over-owned, perhaps a little expensive. So there is a broadening of this rally taking place, which is really quite healthy. Seasonally, small and mid cap stocks tend to do really well from the middle of October through February, March. Uh, so we're obviously early in that period and the indications are the seasonality. It looks like it's, it's headed to play out. So let's talk a little bit about this week's data. Uh, we had uh, lots more earnings. We got uh, news from the Fed finally that they are beginning their tapering of bond purchases. Again, like everybody I'll say, it doesn't mean that they are taking money out of the market. It means they are putting less in each month. So they believe that they should be through their tapering by the fall of 2022. They did a great job in communicating their plans over several months. Uh, and there was very little impact to the market. In fact, the market took it quite favorably when it took place. Last week, we had improved jobs numbers, uh, which reversed the previous month's weak employment data. That's great. We had some positive news on bottlenecks. We'll talk a little bit about that model bottlenecks in the supply chain. We had some really good news out of Pfizer on a therapeutic that, that could be used for people who were showing symptoms and that it would would keep 90% of them out of the hospital. Uh, and we finally saw <clears throat> the Democrats get uh, uh, 
uh, an infrastructure bill through the House. So it, all it needs now is the signing by the president. So some things starting to clear from that perspective on earnings. We're now 447 of 500 S&P 500 companies reported. On average, 18% revenue growth over a, a depressed, obviously, 2020, 41% earnings growth. Those are important things. Importantly, uh, uh, sectors were rallying on the news. So the market was taking the news as good news. Uh, and from a surprise standpoint, the average company beat the analyst estimates from revenue perspective by 2.57%. Uh, and the earnings surprise was 9.5%. Uh, 9 a few groups really stood out. Energy beat the estimates by about 14%. Financials beat by about 15%. So those stand out and certainly are supportive to two big groups that we're focused on in the portfolios. When we look at how that stood up versus recent quarters, you know, over 80% of companies beat the estimates. Uh, only a small percent missed. There were a few more that missed estimates than the first and the second quarter, but not really much of consequence. So in general, a strong earnings period. On bottlenecks, we are seeing some clearing in some of the bottlenecks. This is the Baltic Dry Index, which is the, the shipping rate on dry bulk. And we have seen 12 straight days lower in price. It's showing that maybe some of the kinks are being worked out of the system. That's a positive because there is demand, we know, but the ability to supply has been difficult. If you can match those up better, we're gonna get better profitability and profit margins out of companies. Uh, and uh, certainly they could start restocking some of the inventories that have been causing a problem. <clears throat> as far as economic surprises go, this is the city economic surprise index. And we know that from uh, during the winter, March, April, until early September, much of the economic data that was coming in while it was improved over last year, it was coming in below expected numbers. And of course the market sat up and took note of that. Some of the more economically sensitive groups were sloppy through April, May, June, July. But in the middle of September, that seems to have bottomed and in fact started to move higher. So the economic data has been beating over the last two months. And importantly, we've moved back through the zero line, back to positive numbers, and it looks like things are accelerating to the upside. So certainly supportive of economically sensitive groups and their shares are behaving accordingly. We always like to say, <clears throat> is the market behaving the way it should be given what we think we know? So we're gonna jump through a couple of data points. You know, we know that we have um, uh, Christmas season coming up. We talked last week about how the holiday season was pointing toward high single digit growth. Uh, that's very positive, better than we've seen in the last few years. Okay, so <clears throat> our job is to focus on leadership. We don't need to be in every sector all the time. Our job is to pick and choose. We're getting paid to be an active manager. We're watching for change so that if we were to see change taking place in the market, data to support it, we should be repositioned in the portfolio. And sometimes we're being paid to be defensive and that's been a big part of our strategy over time using stop losses and at times hitting with sitting with elevated cash positions, waiting for a better opportunity. We recognize that our clients who are all for the most part, private investors, their biggest thing is don't lose the money. So if there is an opportunity, our job is to generate a relative return to the market. It's to try and generate an absolute or positive return. And that's why we're sort of, sort of so tactical. So let's talk about the themes and see if, we're continuing to see upward trajectory in the areas we are focused in. So we'll start with financials. It's our biggest weight. About 30% of all the assets the barometer manages is focused in financial services. Uh, now that includes banks, uh, regional banks, uh, asset managers. It includes uh, insurance companies. It includes um, uh, some of the capital markets, investment banks. And the reason for that is while we're here sitting here in Canada, knowing that our banks had a pretty good go through the financial crisis, not the case in the rest of the world. It's a sector that was pretty universally hated. And in fact, this pink box, which you see on the left part of the screen is the range that the large banks traded in from 2008 until March of 2021, when finally 
for the first time in 13 years, the banks made a new high. So as in looking at the whole market itself, when the market goes sideways for 12, 13, 15 years without making any advance, and then finally makes a new high, it generally kicks off a new bull market. It looks like that was the case in the financials. So this is the ETF for the large banks in the US. It made a new high in early, uh, late February. And then we consolidated as some of that economic data was weakening. Now, if this was going to fail, it would have failed on that pullback. And maybe it would have meant we had another several years before we would ultimately get going. But on cue, held at the long-term moving average, turned higher and is now making a higher high. So I have to say the confidence level that we have in some of these long-term themes, having broken out of a long sideways period, has gone up two or three notches since we made these new all-time highs. So I would say that the first leg last year into April, May was a tickler. We got a test in the summer, passed the test with flying colors, and now it's game on. It looks like we've started a new bull market for financial services, very important sector uh, for the US as it is in Canada. And we're seeing it in banks, insurance companies, asset managers, capital markets. We're really seeing it across the board. They tend to do well when rates rise, which co coincides well with our view that long-term rates probably saw long-term bottom over the last year. So in Canada, Bank of Montreal had a great last uh, month or so. This is one of our biggest positions. We've talked about it a few times. We've talked about some of the other Canadian banks. And the reason is that we think these are going to be great dividend growth engines. We know that in the last week, OFSI in Canada approved the banks returning to dividend growth or increasing their dividends and increasing their share buybacks. They have all met their capital requirements with flying colors. Uh, and their dividend payouts are relatively low relative to history because they've been asked to hold back. And if they were to raise them to 40%, 45%, 50%, it would represent significant upside to their dividends. And we're going to hear that over the next few weeks. They also will be able to increase their share buybacks. To put it in context, this has been the typical range for Bank of Montreal between 40 and 50% of their earnings paid out in dividends. They're currently sitting at 33%. It represents an opportunity to see a significant increase in dividend going forward. And when you have rising rates, we want to see rising dividend streams to offset that. Much more attractive than companies with a flat dividend stream. Now, not every area of financials is doing well. One of the areas that investors hid over the last few years, while the banks and asset managers and so on were not doing well, were digital payments. And we noted a little while ago that digital payments, this is the iPay ETF, had started to relatively underperform. We are short iPay in our macro portfolio. And we also, in our long short portfolio, have been short PayPal, which yesterday you may have heard disappointed on earnings. So difficult for PayPal shareholders, good if you're short. Uh, but you know this market is a market that's discerning good from bad and maybe expensive from inexpensive. Outside of financials, consumer discretionary, a big part of the U.S. economy, 70% of the U.S. economy, certainly has seen an improvement. Now, part of this would have been fueled by the Pfizer news last week. Services have really been lifting, travel and leisure getting a lot better. But this began before the Pfizer news came out. But again, percent of stocks making a three-month high at about 35%. Again, very often these spikes start to take place early on in a rally <clears throat> and consumer staples offense versus cons sorry consumer discretionary offense versus consumer staples defensive again continues to relatively outperform more economically sensitive versus defensive or less economically sensitive we prefer consumer discretionary uh, and certainly within this area, the autos have been doing well. We've heard a lot about Tesla, but look at Ford. Ford is one of the biggest positions in the firm. It's very inexpensive. They have a very big opportunity uh, moving to electric cars. 
uh, they're making a great push and the market is really certainly rewarding them. Stocks run recently from $13 to 20, still only trading at 11 times earnings. So very, very interesting. Technology, technology continues to be quite strong. Some of the FANG stocks, not so much. Some of the underlying companies doing very well, but the percent of stocks making a three month high also just shy of 40%. So this group is breaking out again. Um, we've talked about being more economically sensitive than predictable. So we've preferred semiconductors to software and semis relative to software really had a great week this week, moving higher. Four key holdings for Barometer, just about the largest holding in the firm, NVIDIA, obviously had a great week um, selling into the cloud, selling into autonomous driving. They had some great news today. They're partnered uh, with LAZR uh, in LiDAR um, uh, vision for automated driving, <clears throat> but they're also of course used in, uh, in uh, crypto mining, they're used in gaming, and uh, they just had a blowout quarter. Advanced micro devices also had a great couple of weeks. Broadcom, AVGO, <clears throat> uh, which we talked about this past week on BNN, uh, had a great week <clears throat> and lattice semiconductors. So really across the board, this sector, while chips are in short supply, are very profitable and great source of demand there. Cybersecurity also continued to do well over the course of the week. We've had three straight weeks higher, uh, certainly could afford to take a breath. Uh, we have CloudStrike, uh, Crowd, uh, CrowdStrike here, which is one of the one of the probably leading companies within the group. Cloud computing also continuing to do well. This is the ETF SKYY. Again, another group that consolidated from February and has broken out, started a new move higher. On the single stock side, Microsoft is one of our big holdings. We also have Google, both performing very, very well. And we own this ETF in our macro portfolio. Energy, an important area for the Canadian market. This is the Canadian <coughs> capped energy index. Uh, had a good sized correction through July and August, but since then made a turn and ran for the border and we're making new highs. <clears throat> These companies are still relatively expensive and it's really important to understand how small energy has become as part of the market. Now, this is a very cyclical group and at times it's been very important and times less important. In the S&P 500, where energy is a much smaller piece of the index, in the early 1990s it was 15% of the index, went as low as four around uh, 2000. In 2008, it was 16% of the S&P. Recently, it was 2.1. And with all of the rally that we've had so far uh, this past summer, still only 2.9% of the index. So carbon-based energy, certainly unpopular. We're going to need it for a while. It's not the only area of, of energy that's rallying. We've talked about lithium. We've talked about solar, uh, also both important. Within our macro portfolio, we own energy producers, we own solar, we own lithium. Um, I think that the energy space is all going to be important as the world reaccelerates. Also staying within the commodity space, the mining stocks are certainly acting better. After consolidating from June <clears throat> to October, they made lows in October, started rallying higher. Again, this pink box actually goes all the way back to 2014, where they'd been in a bear market commodities as a whole in a bear market from 2008 until this year. So if we look at it in a longer term perspective here, you can see it. 2014, 2020 Wayne makes a new high, consolidate and breaks out to the upside. And within the miners, we want to know what is it that is most likely to be in short supply. So this is a chart that BMO Research did looking at those commodities that have potential for short-term constraints, which we're seeing in some commodities currently, but also then on another axis, the potential for long-term shortages. In other words, undersupply and a lack of new supply coming on. So within these, we think that the sweet spot looks like copper and nickel, both important for electric vehicles, and met coal, important for steel production. So we have met coal exposure through tech resources in Canada, and we have copper exposure a couple of ways. Now, just to put copper in perspective, on this chart is the range of inventories over time 
the five-year range. We know that 2020 hugged the very bottom end of this range. And now in 2021, as demand is picking up around the world for copper, including electric vehicles, we are now way below the range of the historical inventories for copper. Now in commodities, the last marginal dollar of demand sets the price for everyone. So if you have three bottles of water and you're walking through the desert and there's four people, how much will the fourth person pay for one of those bottles of water? And that becomes the clearing price. So copper price is likely to move higher and stay higher for some time. We own both the uh, copper ETF uh, and we own Freeport McMoran as significant holdings within the lithium space. Again, you can see this is one of the areas that is both short-term constrained and long-term constrained. Uh, we own the lithium ETF LIT, which has been one of the best performing <clears throat> ETFs in the world of macro. So there's the copper ETF, having broken out of a long-term uh, consolidation, and then Freeport McMoran, which is leading the group higher. So interesting opportunities here, but to put it in perspective, again, this is the beginning of something, not the end. Also within uh, mining, we have some smaller companies, of course, seasonally, not a bad time to do that. 4N mining is one, capstone resource is another, again, relatively small weights, uh, but there could be significant upside in these companies. Okay, moving forward, industrials, <clears throat> another economically sensitive group consolidated through the course of the summer, mid-October with the market broke out, but you know, having a very good percentage point move this, uh, this ETF, which is equally weighted of mid-size industrial companies, moved from 105 to 118. Uh, so about a 12% increase over the last two, two to three weeks. Uh, and certainly looks like it's headed higher. The transports have been a big supporter in this area. And the Pfizer news is likely going to help travel and leisure. Uh, and with the bottlenecks clearing in some places, uh, that could be helpful for some of the rest of the transports groups. So stuff that isn't working, utilities continue to be difficult. It's not that they're going down, it's just they are not performing. So they're providing the function that they're there for, they're paying a significant dividend. Dividend growth is not high, and as a result, they're underperforming the market. This is relative price performance versus the S&P. Now, it's not to say there aren't some outliers. We own NextEra Energy, which is the largest company in renewable energy, renewable power, and it's significantly outperforming the group, but this is a group that we are avoiding. It's, a, it's an anchor in portfolios. I showed last week or the week before that the bond proxy sectors, which include telecom, utilities, uh, and consumer staples, are trading at one and a half times the valuation of the average company in the S&P. And they're all underperforming. Consumer staples relative to the S&P, utilities versus the S&P, just like bonds relative to the S&P, underperforming. So if you have groups that have done really well for a long period of time, that are broadly owned and very expensive, and they are underperforming, sooner or later, one by one, investors will choose to become sellers. We want to own sectors that are under-owned, that have improving fundamentals, where the prices are outperforming the market. It means that investors are happy. They're not ready to become sellers. And so these groups for us are likely sources of cash to be doing other things. Even during the market's corrective period between August and October, these groups did not outperform the market, as you can see here on the chart. So they really are not performing a defensive function. Dividend growth, on the other hand, dividend growth, this is RDVY, the ETF that invests in companies that have had a history of raising their dividend, certainly outperforming, uh, broke out of this nice base that it went through over the course of the summer. And like other economically sensitive sectors, now reaccelerating. So let's sum this up. Over the last 30 days, as of November the 5th, groups that have most improved technically or in their relative performance versus the market, transportation, precious metals, consumer cyclicals, largely auto, commodity, industrial, technology. This is where we want to be. If we look at the overall rankings of what seems to be acting the best in the market, 
where there is support, where there is sponsorship. Again, financials, energy, technology, commodity related, transportation, industrials, agriculture, basic materials, consumer cyclical. These are all areas that we're focused in. Now, good news for Canada. Canada on a relative basis actually is now for the first time outperforming the US stock market. And that has a lot to do with the sector weights. Canada, of course, has a very large financials weight, a very much larger energy weight, uh, and a good tech weight. Also has a larger industrial weight and a significantly larger materials weight. So Canada is well suited to the kind of environment that we're in. And as a result, we have an overweight position in Canada. When we look at the sector weights, about 30% of our assets firm wide are in financials, about a triple weight of the S&P. We've got about a 20% weight in, in technology, which is an underweight relative to the US, uh, the S&P. We've got an 11% weight in energy. We've taken it down slightly just because seasonally between October and December, there can be some seasonal weakness in energy. We'll see. Uh, industrials we've taken up as we've seen the relative performance improve. Materials is about a double weight. Uh, and we have continued to have pretty low weights in communications, communi uh, consumer staples, healthcare, and utilities. From a market cap perspective, we've taken our exposure to small and mid cap stocks higher. Now, mid cap is companies 15 billion and below. So we're not talking about little tiny penny stocks. We're talking about very substantial businesses, but less focused in the largest of the companies. And geographically, we have overweighted Canada because of our view as both currency is improving <clears throat> and the sectors that are represented uh, uh, act a little bit better in Canada. So as far as, um, uh, as far as the macro portfolio goes, macro includes some additional sectors that you wouldn't see in an equity portfolio. We can have some sort of pure commodity exposure. And after very good consolidation in precious metals, they finally are starting to break out to the upside. So we do have some exposure to gold and silver. And we certainly have exposure to cryptocurrencies through Ethereum and Bitcoin. Let's just talk about that for a moment. I don't think that still <clears throat> uh, the cryptocurrency world is well understood, but think of it this way. When the internet was started, it was a network of computers communicating with one with the other, enabling companies to build businesses on top of that platform. So nobody owned the internet. The Ethereum blockchain is a group of computers, thousands of computers that are all linked together to verify transactions, the validity of transactions. And Ethereum is the unit that is attached to that transaction. When you own Ethereum, you own a piece of the Ethereum network. Think of it like owning part of the internet. When a transaction takes place, Ethereum is the unit that gets attached to an asset or a contract that's settled between two parties. When the transaction is settled, part of the Ethereum is burned, is gone forever. So it's in limited quantities. It's attached to a productive platform. It's like, think of Jeff Bezos got wealthy on the Amazon platform selling goods from everyone. Um, uh, Facebook is a platform that companies built applications on top of to make money. By owning Ethereum, we own a piece of the Ethereum network. And the Ethereum network is growing at three times the speed that the internet grew from the beginning. So there are thousands of companies building applications using the Ethereum network to complete transactions without an intermediary. So think of doing financial transactions from one person to another without a bank standing in between to verify the transaction. The blockchain verifies the transaction. I think that we are in the very early days. Our macro portfolio has a 12% stake between Ether and Bitcoin. We'll see how this continues to transpire. Things can, can go wrong, I'm certain. 
But the reality is this is becoming an institutionalized asset. Large asset managers and corporations are beginning to embrace this. <clears throat> and we want to have a piece. This is one of the only times where private investors have had an opportunity to be involved in something before the larger investors have. And as it's becoming more liquid <clears throat> and finding its way into ETFs, which will be approved over the next few months, we think that this is a this is sort of one, one time in a lifetime that there may be a chance that the financial system is being rewired. So we'll talk more about that and likely do a webcast specifically on the topic for those that are interested. But after, again, consolidating through the summer, Ethereum has started off to the upside and generally has a strong end of the year and Bitcoin's just also made a new high. So we think that this looks good <clears throat> out over the next number of months and we think that it will look good over the next number of years. So in our macro portfolios, we're expressing the view the same way. We're just using ETFs to do it. Our biggest weights here, it's a little bit more tilted to economically sensitive. Industrials are the biggest weight, followed by precious metals, financials, uh, some commodities, metals, materials, consumer discretionary, energy, and the cryptocurrencies we just talked about. We've got a 10% weight in the Canadian market. We've got a 6% weight in emerging markets. Uh, and we have a focus on dividend growth. On the short side, this is a long, short portfolio. We are short government debt. We are short the US dollar versus the basket of world currencies. We're short emerging market debt, utilities, telecom, and consumer staples. So if your view is that we are in a reflationary environment, if you are concerned that there's a potential that there is inflation in the system, these portfolios have been built for this environment. And that's our job. Our job is to make sure that the portfolios are in line with what's happening in the real economy. We don't need to own everything. Seasonally, as we've talked about, November to April are the most productive months. <clears throat> We're headed into it with all of our models positive. We will watch every day for signs that either sectors are losing steam, new sectors are emerging, or that we're seeing weakness at the asset class level in either equities or commodities. But at this point, that's not the case. We're happy to play defense when the time comes, uh, but we look for a pretty good move into year end. I'm certain that there's going to be some bumps along the way, <clears throat> but we'll watch closely. And with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks. Thanks so much, Dave. We do have a quick question on new issues. Specifically, what barometers thought process on new issues and um, what pools would have greater exposure to new issues that we offer to investors? Okay, so, so um, like any other uh, investment manager, we follow new issue markets very closely. James Callahan on the US side and Jim Skatakis on the Canadian side, um, uh, Brian McNichol and Amit Yoshi, along with Greg, spent a lot of time looking at the new issues coming in the pipeline. We execute transactions <clears throat> on trading desks with I think 21 different trading desks. All of them keep us in the loop on issues that are coming and being marketed. In many cases, we're, we're well aware of deals coming before they're uh, in the pipeline, just waiting for them as something that's ultimately going to come. So we spend a lot of time analyzing them. Uh, in many cases, as you know, uh, when a deal is, a, is a, a hot deal or well followed, it's a bit of a fist fight to get access. <clears throat> but we punch definitely above our weight because we are active in the new issue market. Uh, and so uh, there's been lots of opportunities this year, and I think that there will continue to be. Uh, we'll see what happens with Rivian tomorrow. That's going to be a very interesting uh, issue for the for electric vehicle market. Of course, you may know Amazon has given them an order for 100,000 delivery vans. Amazon owns 22%. Uh, Ford owns, uh, I believe, 11%. And that, this makes them a, a real contender in that space. So um, lots of opportunities here. In fact, I run a screen regularly that takes all of the new issues that have been issued over the course of the last 12 months, sorts out any of those that have traded below the issue price. And one of the things we found is when something maybe dips below the issue price a few weeks after it was issued and goes through a period of time where maybe it's underperformed a little bit, when it comes back through the issue price, I call it a U-turn, 
and makes a new high, generally means all the sellers have been washed out and the, the coast is clear. And so that's a screen I run about weekly watching, watching those. So this is an interesting area because of course, the new Amazon or Apple or Google will come out as a new issue at some point and we need to be aware of them relatively early on. And uh, we, we've, we've had a pretty good go with some of them. So it's an important area. Thanks so much, Dave. The next question is uh, on electric vehicles, the space. I know you've touched on our positioning in Ford uh, as one of our darling uh, positions. How about your favorite EV ETF? Because we know you <laughs> love your ETFs, Dave. Well, you know, you can get great exposure to uh, EV through the DRIV ETF. So this is a Global X uh, auto and electric vehicle ETF. You know, it's, it's a little bit extended. It can certainly pull back a little bit. Uh, it's about a billion dollars inside, so it's relatively liquid. Uh, another that is a little bit less pure EV focused is uh, the Global Auto ETF, C-A-R-Z. And you can see, you know, it is a combination of electric vehicle and traditional. Uh, another way to play electric vehicles is through the lithium ETF, LIT. So that's batteries and uh, lithium. So that includes battery manufacturers and the materials producers, nickel, lithium, and so on. Uh, that's another way. This is a $5 billion ETF. Um, all three of those would be a, a good vehicle to look at. Thanks so much, Dave. Well, this question uh, leads into um, an understanding of our thoughts as a firm on ESG. I mean, just the conversation alone with, uh, with respect to the ETFs that we're putting in our portfolios that um, play the EV space is, you know, demonstration that ESG is here. ESG investment thesis uh, certainly makes up a great a portion of thought on how we manage our portfolios and how we look to invest. Um, and this investor or prospective investor is wondering um, if this area, the ESG area of the market is gaining or losing momentum. My, my bet is that it's gaining momentum, but he wants to understand your thought process on that. Uh, look, I think that ESG is an important investment theme and you know, for the world, I think it's, I think it's uh, something that's important to be front uh, top of mind. I think it's problematic in some ways because we have to be pragmatic. Um, in many ways, the world is going to need carbon-based energy for a long time. And um, as we showed, it's become a very small part of the index. And when something is underinvested in for a period of time, as perhaps uh, energy production has been, uh, or some of the metals that go into an EV, but it's still mi mined, um, they become in short supply. So our first responsibility to our investors is to generate a return, and we have to balance these things. So, um, you know, we do own energy producers. Uh, we think that that's something that's essential globally in order for us to all move the goods around that we need currently. Um, but it is certainly an important theme. We do score our investments on an ESG basis. We do look very closely, and I think the majority of our holdings are ESG. You would never see us buy a tobacco stock, I can tell you that. Um, but, you know, we do own some defense uh, uh, companies. It, it's, it's a necessary thing at times. So ESG is going to be an important investment theme going forward, but I think that we have to be pragmatic about it um, uh, and, uh, and look at every investment on a case-by-case -case basis. Thank you, David. As always, we appreciate your insight and guidance, um, and I will leave you with the final word. <laughs> well, what we appreciate is, is all of you, the viewers we appreciate our clients. Thank you very much for, for entrusting us with your, with your portfolios. As, as you know, our, our whole reason for being is to build an investment strategy that is built for private investors. And I think that a private investor has a very different set of expectations than a pension fund does. 
the market goes down 35 and we go down 33, we don't feel like we've hit a home run, but if we're a pension manager, we beat the benchmark. Uh, so I think our strategy is, is quite different than that type of manager. Uh, we really are going to try and pick our spots. And while we may sound quite bullish right now, uh, there are times when it's time to play defense. And uh, we watch very closely for signs that that is the case. Uh, so thank you for being clients. If you're not a client and you'd like to be, certainly we would love to speak with you. Uh, I'm always happy to have a conversation and our investment counselors would be happy to set that up. So thanks very much for joining us today. And Pam, thanks for hosting. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Great. Thank you, David. Oh, you're in November. <laughs> yep. Just keeps clicking away. <laughs> Bye, Dave. Bye-bye.